Welcome to Talent Takeover Unfiltered. When it comes to working hard and keeping it real, we know our shit. Self-care, happiness, inner peace, and time. I'm Brianna Rooney, and this is Taylor Bradley. Hey, y'all. And we have thrived in chaos and turned it into an art form. So, Taylor, what are we doing here today? We're here to give you a raw, under-the-hood view of all things recruiting and finally give credit where credit is due to a long, underrated industry that's full of, quote-unquote, experts. All right. Well, then let's take this show to the road. Hello, welcome to Talent Takeover Unfiltered. We have such an amazing session today because the title is No More Mrs. Nice Recruiter. This is featuring Carrie Jules and of course, the one and only Taylor Bradley. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. How are you doing, Carrie? Good. Getting ready for the holidays. That sort of thing. (laughs) I love that. Can can you see the... (laughs) Reference here. <laughs> Love that. So let's, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to even think how we start this episode. So yeah, we're talking about really, I and, and I know we've already done like the power of recruiting, that how do we talk to hiring managers? We've kind of touched on all this, but this is kind of reiterating it. And I would say more from a how, like, we don't want to get run over. We have a job to do and we can't let anyone affect our ability to do our jobs. So correct. Talk me through that. So, yeah. So because kind of what we talked about is, you know, the the end point, the, the conclusion that I came to at 51 when I was in a room with other managers who were all men at that time was mm-hmm. I needed to talk like them. I needed to talk like a man. And regardless of all the like DE&I things and all that about it, but like I needed to speak their language to get my point across because my point was valid mm-hmm. and my point was meaningful and it was important for the business. It wasn't about ego. It wasn't about like being right or wrong. It was genuinely what was right for the business. And in this point, in this one time was like, whether or not we pursue a role, like, do we shut down this role, which will impact the, it had as a a leadership role. So it impacted, had a lot of impact. And for me to get my message across, I had to do it in a way that they heard. And for me, speaking like a man means, I'm going to say it, even though it contradicts what you just said, and it's in a group and it's not going to, it might make you look bad but you know what they do it to each other and they don't care I cared and so when I was preparing for us to talk about this I would listen to other podcasts and kind of really trying to understand and what really came through Taylor was when you were talking you had a friend that was like pushing your boundaries and having that really upfront talk to say hey this is a boundary and you had another gentleman on whose name was Dominic and I don't remember his last name and oh yeah credit to the question you asked him Brianna is how do you be confident and he was like I don't know and it's like the two of the Dominics of the world, they're born with it. I have my middle kid. There's nothing you can say to him. Like, he just came out of the gate. He's never crushed. Um, but for people like me, like, being able to come to that conclusion that you have permission to contradict, like, it took me a long time and it takes. And so this, I'm hoping we will have meaningful nuggets for people who just don't yeah. naturally have it in their DNA. You can learn it. You can be that outspoken person. You can be that confident person in the room. But it's a skill you have to work at. And you may have other skills that those people don't. And that this is something that I have to work at all the time. Like, it's this not. Is so good. I know. I was like, I'll, I'll let you go first. Yeah. So <laughs> like, no, I, I want to hear, like, how did you work? At, I am so intrigued for people that are not naturally that way. Because I, I truly did think, like, you're either this way or you're not. You either tell it like it is. or you. I mean, I've just, yeah. that's how I've always been and how I've always who I've surrounded myself with, you kind of are this type of personality or you're not. So I'm dying to hear, like, how did you work on that? Through years. Like, it really took a long time. I come from a social work background and communications really important. But I really was like, this is the thing I was thinking about is like, how do I start someone who's 22 and new mm-hmm. to the room and can't go into the room and being like, all right, is the strategy here not make sense? But, you know, that's the, the things you need to work off as you start are working one to one working Mm -hmm. with your manager and not taking on a room full of people and understanding your business. So I think for recruiters, understanding your space and being good at your space and knowing Mm -hmm. your data um, and then understanding your business and being able to reference it and taking that conversation one-to-one and get really good at your one-to-one conversations. Um, And you rebuild it over time. And to me, the, the, the big moment was when it was when a room with eight leaders like if that room went down forum labs would no longer exist 
that's the company I work for. Like it would be done. Um, and being able to speak up and contradict in that space. You don't start off there. You start off one-to-one -to, -one to be like, okay. And we all have those meetings as recruiters with hiring managers who want to send you down a crazy path. Um, and you have to reel them back in. And the thing that I always go back to in my core is, is this a good strategy? Is this strategy going to yield the result? And I think about that before I go into a meeting and before like the here, what I was like, what's the right strategy for us to get the output that we want? And so you get those correct thinking patterns. It allows you to take the emotionality out of it, which is a lot of what I have to do because I emote first um, and speaking through emotions and ego, it does, isn't that helpful? And we've all dealt with people who aren't managing that. Mm -hmm. Um, and you really kind of practice at it. You're going to have good conversations. You're going to have bad conversations. But if you go at it with good faith, you'll get better at it over time to have these hard discussions to contradict somebody's belief. Um, because a lot of times in recruiting, it's this crazy space where it's so data driven. But I feel like a lot of our role is like anecdotally, a manager will be like, well, this is what I believe. And you're like, well, first of all, I don't have my charts with me to show you that maybe it isn't. It's anecdotal, right? I've mm -hmm. talked to 100 people. They they didn't reflect what you're saying to me, but I don't have it written down. So experiential, but being strategic about what behavior in you that you want to gain. Is it being able to contradict? Well, being able to speak up and doing that in a one-to-one -one space and knowing that what data that you have to have ready at your fingertips to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So what I'm loving from this is permission to contradict. Because we've been talking about, look, it's a conversation, not a confrontation, you know, and like, you know, um, I know we've been, like we got this on post-its right all over. No, hey, it's just a conversation. We're just walking the surf. But contradicting someone like you don't even think like, wow, that's actually that can be confrontational. Right. And so as you're in this mega room, how do you do you wait your turn or do you, you know, intersect yourself like you're just like. You got to follow the culture of the room. And in our culture, it is very like, you know, con like the interrupt and um, but be professional and you match the room. And one thing I want to share in all of this, this is not dealing with someone who's toxic like that is a whole different. That's a different conversation when you mm -hmm. have talked that this is dealing with professionals who are all have the same goal as you and are working towards it. Um, and you have to match the culture of the room. A little bit and that's what we i feel like good recruiters do is we match the culture of who we're talking with if i am with a technical person i'm going to be very different than if i'm with a creative person um and so you have to read the room on the culture um and then understand if the culture isn't helping us what are the baby steps we can do to change culture because culture is not going to change on a light switch yeah it's so way it's way heavier than that so yeah I, I'm just envisioning, especially if this isn't your nature, right? I'm just thinking of all the anxiety. You're sweating. You got you need your extra deodorant on with this meeting. Yes. But how do you, and I'm almost thinking of that as like a game, like how do you get yourself pumped to essentially act like someone, you know, internally that's not your nature? So how do you yeah. go into that room and be like, here we go. I'm going into war right now. How do you get ready for that? I think it's knowing and predicting when it's going to happen, where you can. I, you know, we do have, we're, we're reasonably predictable. We know what these meetings are. We know what we can prepare. Um, and being and practicing and knowing what you need to practice on. Is it that they're asking you to look for a candidate that doesn't meet their needs? Come prepared with, here's a couple different profiles. So I think preparation is key. Um, and I think practice is key. And I think that you knowing that behavior for you, that like you want to be better at these, you have to prepare um, to a certain extent to enter into these conversations so you're not blindsided. Because what happens is if you avoid the conflict, you're going to follow what they tell you. It's not going to end well. And you own that poor recruiting process. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So my my stepdad um, was always like a business mentor to me. He's an entrepreneur. And so I'm just envisioning like going into war. And I and actually I, I have a bracelet that says WWBD. What would Blake do? <laughs> so I feel like that's how you're like, are you going? What's yeah. John doing? What's Steve doing today? Like, how would how would he handle this conversation? You know, is is this heavy with does, with imposter syndrome? Does that ever come creeping in? Like, how do you say like, no, thanks. This is still me. 
Um, you know, I, I will be honest. I see the imposter syndrome and I never connected with it in the sense of, um, maybe it's, it's something that I always am trying to be better at what I do. And we always should have a version of it. Like, I don't, I don't know how to articulate it that like, I'm always looking at myself and maybe I do have it. Maybe I don't have it. But for me to be better in this role, like this is the, the goal I have to achieve. Um, and so sometimes we have to be uncomfortable versions of ourselves to get it, whether it's we have to be harder or we have to be softer or if it's we have to be these things. But for most, for many women um, or people that being confrontive, and I shouldn't say just women, being confrontive is really hard. Um, and this role to do well in, a lot of times you have to do it. I, I don't know. That's my experience that like I have to be confrontive and being like this type of candidate you have is two in the world what are we going to do and they're like we're going to wait it okay then I will just report back you know my stats and we're going to do it that way and we have we're on the same page like that sort of thing I hope that's helpful oh it is it's so interesting to hear other people's experiences because I think so much about this going back to what we originally were talking about or how we started the conversation is like so much of it is who you are I think a lot of it is how you grew up And how you were raised, if you were one of those people that was like allowed to speak your opinion or if it's like, you know, children are to be seen, not heard, you know, that old school mentality, you know what I mean? And I was always the kid growing up and I'm, Brianna will laugh when I say this, but I was like, why, why, why? Like I always ask why. So anytime we would do anything at work, I'm like, why? You know, just I have to seek to understand, but I, you know, carried that into who I am as an adult as well. Like I need to understand what good is this going to accomplish? What purpose is it? I just strategy. It's a, it's a curiosity thing. It's not that I'm like trying to undermine anybody or nope. criticize them. I just am always, I, I need to understand. It's something that will like eat away at me if I'm like, but why did we do it like that? I just need to understand. But in my experience, which I feel like I've maybe been fortunate to have where I, I felt like I could speak up, but it was over time. So that's one thing, that, a piece of advice that I would give listeners is that I think you, I think people actually will respect you more when you speak up, but I do feel there is a time and a place and a, like a, a I don't know, probationary period, so to speak. Yeah. Like whenever you're, you first join a company in your first 90 days, you're not going to be in a room with C-suites and chiming in. You know, I think you have to like, there has to be some time where you've built rapport and respect and trust with people before they'll even be receptive of your opinion or your insight. Even if, you know what's best because you're the subject matter expert in XYZ, you know, and your title reflects that, your experience reflects that. They know they don't, they're in engineering, you know, it's just two different, two different apples, right? Or apples and oranges. But I do think that you have to, with any job, you have to have established a certain amount of rapport and respect before your voice can even be heard. Correct. And I always wonder, does that apply to men as well? Or yeah, that's what I was just going to push you. I'm like, maybe not. Because- I, mean, I will tell you, I don't think it does. Because how many new managers come into me and they're typically male to be like, I have ideas. And because I have long tenure where I'm at and I feel like I'm an experienced person, I'm like, that is terrific. Let me tell you what we're going to do. And then you can tell me how that matches. And I'm way more forceful now, seven years in, mm-hmm. than I was year one. Like, I don't even entertain it. Like, I'm just like, no, we're just, I've been doing this role. We know. We know. Um, I could not get away with that day, you know, year one, month one. Mm-hmm. Just no. And you, you have to build that over time. But should I go to a new role and sometime in the future, I'm happy where I'm at, but should I go to a new one? I think I could get to that rapport building way faster than right, I could. Right, right before and I think experiential and that's why I think it's something if it's you have to know if confrontation is hard for you you don't get to you shouldn't be avoiding confrontations you should be building the skills so that you can have them because oh. addressing it and that's what this is is like for me it took me to 51 to be like, oh I just gotta talk like them because they don't care they don't care <laughs> I'm actually gonna challenge what you said though and say it's not avoiding confrontation it's avoiding a conversation It's because yeah, just yeah, just approaching with your opinion or asking why it's not confrontational. You're seeking to understand or you're offering your insight. But I think the way you said it is what most people believe is that anytime you say something or challenge, it's confrontation when it's it's not. And Taylor, here's where I will will counting you in a nice way is that (laughs) you you don't feel it confrontive. For me, twenty years ago, it it would have felt totally confrontive to just really. 
it yeah. comes from that that the DNA thing. Like it's just yeah. I, as I like in my perfect little bubble, if I was like a step out of college, I would be like I wanted to be a social worker and help people. Guess what? The first thing you learned in social work school, you're setting boundaries. You're telling people to convincing them things they want to do. The last thing you need to be is nice. You want to be supportive mm -hmm. and emotive and empathetic, but you're not going to be what's classified as nice, which is compliant to other, you know, can be defined as compliant to other people. So mm -hmm. getting to the point of understanding it is a conversation was actually one of the steps in the journey for me to be good at having hard conversations is to understand it was a conversation and not a confrontation, but it felt like confrontation to me, but I had to take that emotionality down. And the way oh. and get it to the st st strategy, strategic yeah. business need. And it's that that is a mental switch in me and taking that emotionality out. So how do you even know that you just being emotional? You know, because like I, I look at it as um, when we're talking about nice. Well, everyone wants to be a nice person. Yeah. You know, so it's like, OK, that's just it's same like with selfish. No, that's self-care. You know, I feel like yeah. we're constantly trying to reframe how we um, see and feel words. Mm -hmm. So how do you even start that process? That's a heavy one, I think. Me? Yeah. <laughs> You're the star of our show. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's one of those things is where, you know, you learn over time. It's like, you know, is it hitting my ego? Do I want to be liked? Why is my feelings hurt? Like, why am I feeling something less than positive? Right. And then I'm like, we, they did, they did. They're just giving me information. They they're not speaking mm -hmm. to who I am as a human. They're, it's it's a business transaction. That is you who is perceiving it. So I think really getting good at gauging what's your internal, what's going on, and where it's coming from um, is critically important. And it helps you in your your work, but it will help you in your private life too. To be like he just stepped on a nerve, but that nerve is actually you know installed by my mom. You know, like <laughs> yeah. You got to yeah. kind of like weed through that. And that's why I think for some people, it's a really long process to get to these, these, uh, to the, to being able to have hard conversations, but hopefully, you know, hijacking the process a little bit and sharing here to be like, Hey, you know, you can have these hard conversations. You can talk like the other people that you see around them and you can join that culture, um, and speak that way. So I have a question. So, you know, it's, it's often said and, and, some of my experience, I've found it to be true that if you're a woman, you speak up or you're direct or blunt, you're a bitch. So yep. I'm just going to call a spade a spade. So ever since you've been on this journey and where you've got to the point that you are now where you, you speak up and you'll have those conversations, do you feel like the perception of you has changed and shifted? Is it that, you know, Carrie's a bitch or is it like, oh, wow, we really see Carrie speaking up like because you've built all this rapport and credibility? Yeah. One, I think society's moved forward a little bit so let's give credit like we're like a little bit um but it's i'm a challenger right and it's i you can call me that but i will challenge you and say why and make me understand the strategy and i will push forward and you know what i'm not here to be liked i'm here to do a good job and i'm here for the business and that is i genuinely like what i do which is putting people in jobs that they're happy at like that's what i that's what i that's what i care about so i think if you're able to withstand that you know people not liking and loving you um if your love language is being told how wonderful you are then like you know working with technical in my world technical people that's not the one like they're they they appreciate what you do you did your job yay but yeah. they're they're not going to emote over you um and uh, that's not the drive that I need. My drive is I really love the technology and I really love getting people. I think it's so important to get people happy in the roles because it's they spend more time with their family there than with their families. And if they can go home with a happy heart of how they spent their day, it's so much more impactful. And so I truly believe I'm doing social work if I can get someone happy in their role and it, it works for them and the business. That's what I care about. I don't care if people call me a bitch. Go ahead. But it's I just so crazy that. that we can't be at all, you know, that we can't be liked and direct, yeah. that we can't be liked and have the best interest yeah. of the business and just challenge opinions or thoughts or perspective in the what's in looking out for the best interest of the business. I think, yes, I agree. There's been some progress, some slight progress, but with regards to women just being bitches for being yeah. direct. But when you said it, you're like, I'm a challenger. And I'm like, I wouldn't even call it that. You know, you're just offering insight. You're trying to help understand so that you can accomplish what's best for the business. But the fact that it's like, 
it would be even labeled as a challenger because you're offering your perspective or maybe your perspective might contradict with someone else. It doesn't mean you're challenging it. You're just offering a different perspective, you know? So I still think it, it could be framed up negatively, even though it's not meant to be. It could, when you're a woman, it's just a little bit different of how those approaches are perceived by people. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I 100% agree. And then that's also why it's difficult for people to get on this journey to learn what they need to do to have yeah. discussions because of that. But the benefit of being able to do it is, to me, far greater than the perception totally. of the few who might be, you know, well, she's challenging to work with. Yeah. Yeah. So do you find that um, throughout this journey that you've gone through, you know, do you find that you're able to, or it, it changed the way that you respond to feedback? Um, yes. I mean, I feel like any person, but I don't, I think it's more holistic than that than versus uh, me being able to, I say personal feedback. When I hear feedback, I mean, personally, how I'm doing things. Yes, it does. You have to leave yourself open. If you're going to go out there and give challenging info, you're going to get it back. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to be better. I'm not here to be the same as I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take me away from my kids, then like I got to be doing better because I don't want to, I'm not done with my career at 51. I still have a long time left. Like I expect to grow. And if I'm not growing, like what's the point? Mm -hmm. Like let me be with my kids and I'll figure it out. I'll get a like smaller lifestyle and, you know, be a new mom. Like if you're taking me away from my kids, I have to be in a, a trajectory that's positive for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. I feel like this is all kind of encompassing. Well, a couple of things. One, Taylor, I'm surprised you didn't say feelings are not facts. So that's something that she brought that she brought to me a couple of years ago. And like, I actually just told myself that last night because I was like kind of going down this <laughs> bad journey. And uh, I'm like, nope, my feeling is not a fact. Facts are not feelings. You know, it goes both ways. And so I definitely think that that, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of it's now. But also, I think what I'm hearing is you go back to your mission. And your mission is, I am a badass at my job. Mm -hmm. And here's my mission. I, I bring amazing careers to people. You know, like, like you said, like they could, they could be anywhere, right? You could stay at home, but you choose to go to work and you choose to do that. But, you know, um, talk about the progression of being a bitch is my really like best friend. Director of marketing has been in this, you know, in her journey for a long time. And she always would get on the special projects, the, the things that really push the needle at the company, right? Like, and she got all this recognition for it. Yet at the end of the year, I got a review and she's like, yeah. And they actually said this to her verbatim. We love the work you do. Can you be less of a bitch about it? And I was like, they did not call you a bitch. She's like, swear to God. And I was like, oh my God. So I'm just thinking of so many things, Carrie, Wayne Taylor, where you're talking. You know, I'm just like, God, we're have we made progress? Maybe. Like, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, maybe some people have, you know. Um, so I, I love to see and love to hear that you've made progress because, like you said, it is a journey. It's a constant it's a journey. And it's it's one, it's a road that you have to take, especially where we're not the tailors of the world, where it comes naturally a little bit. Or, <laughs> You're you just know, naturally bitchy. Yeah. But, <laughs> but to just naturally step on that and to be like, and if you're someone who's listening and, and is, you know, shies away from that, like that's the cue for you to like get on that path. The benefit far outweighs being called a bitch. I don't yeah. care. Like yeah. uh, the benefit outweighs it. Like my skills have grown because I can do this. My ability to go in and, and call, like get us to a strategy that will have an outcome is why, you know, I am worth what I believe I'm worth. So me sitting there and worrying about what you think, no, me being able to better communicate what we're working on and what we're working towards is what you, the business wants out of me. And hopefully yeah. why you were hired. Yeah. And will you be hired again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Taylor, I think it's about that time. I No, I love that. I, there was about a million things that you said that I was like, that could be a broke to boss tip. That's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, it just flows so organically with yeah. you, Carrie. But um, give them your official broke to boss tip. I think if it's scary, do it. Like get out there, do the prep, do it. Um, learn what you need to learn and don't be... Don't be afraid that if it takes you longer to learn it, like give yourself the space to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. No one gets this, whatever you're working on in a minute. Um, and you just got to keep going at it. Just keep trying. Love that. Yeah. Love that. I love it. Love it. It goes back to if you haven't listened to our episode of getting 1% better every day, 
please listen to that. It's great. And it's going to encompass all of this. So um, everyone, thank you so much for listening. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please share it with all of your TA and recruiting friends. And Carrie, thanks again so much. Taylor, as always, awesome time. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Bye.